Well, good evening again, everyone, and thank you very much. Um, to open the proceedings tonight, I'd like to invite Captain Michelle Payne from the Salvation Army to open the prayer. Thank Let's you. pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of coming and being here to be able to pray, but I just pray your blessing on these people. There are decisions to be made and we voted for them, so let their minds be clear and let their hearts be open, but especially let them see what is happening around them. Amen. Amen. Sorry, Captain Michelle Miles. 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 <laughs> uh, before proceeding, I'd like to remind everyone that the meeting is being recorded audio-visually and will be available on the Council website later this week. And I'd like to pay our respects to all the, to the, uh, to the uh, traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on tonight and uh, particularly respect their elders past and present. Thank you. Right, get myself sorted out here. So to clear the meeting open, um, item one, apologies, we've got Alderman Jock Campbell's on leave and Alderman Heather Chong has been elected by council to be uh, acting as deputy mayor for the period. Mm. Item two, confirmation of minutes for the 30th of July as circulated, be taken as read and Confirmed. Thank you, all Lord Pierce. Second, Lord Bacusi. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Item four, that council notes. Well, there's nothing to report at item three. Item four, the council notes the workshops on the 6th and 13th of August and the agenda brief on the 17th of August. Thank you, Alderman Chong. Second, Alderman Thurley. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Item five. Declarations of interest of Alderman or close associate? There being none. Item six, tabling of petitions. General Manager? Are they ready from the floor? Thank you. Item seven, public question time. There are no matters on notice. Are there any questions from members of the public without notice? Thank you. Item eight. Sorry, Mr. Fig. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, question about advertising by Alderman. Can you tell me the advertising banners and cars and the going around at the moment, advertising the Alderman and specifically one Alderman in particular, is that authorised or paid for by council in any way? Um, three, Mr. Mayor. To my knowledge, it's not authorised or paid by council in any way. In that case, uh, when it comes to election time, there's a, a problem with size of signs going up. And uh, can you tell me where the council stands with the actual signage and authorisation of those locations? Three, Mr. Mayor. Um, signage, in terms of authorisation, is controlled by the election, election electoral commission. The regulations you're referring to in relation to size of signage, I think you'll find was the old local government general regulations which were amended, I think, as of the 1st of August to remove the size limitations on signs. The only control in relation to signs at the moment is the Clarence Interim Planning Scheme. Thank you. Thank you. No other questions from members of the public? Item nine, is, item eight is deputations by members of the public. General Manager. Uh, through Mr Mayor, we have one speaker this evening. Uh, if you care to come forward, Mr Fraser Reid of All Urban Planning, who wishes to address Council in relation to the development application before Council tonight at 151 Mockridge Road. Uh, while you're coming forward, I do need to remind you that there's only a three minute opportunity to speak. <coughs> There'll be a warning in two and a half minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yes, I'm uh, representing Catholic Care, who are the uh, applicants for a rezoning at um, Paradon Vale. I think it's a fairly straightforward rezoning. The Office of Report is supportive and uh, we have no concerns about the report. Um, an issue was raised with me today about maintaining um, public right of passage through the site over an existing um, uh, bitumen uh, pathway and uh, Catholic Care is very supportive of that so we're happy for an additional condition on that. Uh, the other matter that has come up is the matter of uh, fees. Um, 
This one's triggered a $17,000 um, uh, planning application fee. Um, and I know Council has two sort of tiers. There's a $3,500 one for a simple amendment. Uh, and then there's a $17,000 one for rezoning. This one, because it's a rezoning, pushes into that $17,000 uh, automatically. Um, there is, Alderman would be aware that Council has a policy that it can waive those fees, but the policy is 2003, um, and that says um, the maximum fee is $1,500 that could be rebated. Uh, just ask Alderman to, to just think about uh, how the fees would have increased in value since 2003. Uh, and the other thing I'd say is uh, it is a straightforward application and uh, uh, it would be good if, uh, as a not-for-profit, Catholic Care is probably not paying any more than what the real cost is to assess the application, I think is all I'd say. Uh, the average for other councils is about 3500 as a guideline for something of this scale. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, uh, no, no motions on notice. Uh, reports from outside bodies. 10.1, Southern Tasmanian Council's authority that the quarterly report be received. If I could have someone move and second that, please. Gordon Pierce seconded Alderman Farnham. No questions, all those in favour? Carried unanimously. Copying refuse disposal site joint authority, Alderman Walker. Um, the, well, uh, there's no, uh, the quarterly report's still pending, uh, but was there anything else to report, I guess? The AGM is coming very soon, but at the end of the month. Thank you. Uh, Tasmanian Water Corporation, uh, that the quarterly report and the briefing to elected representatives concerning the uh, changes to ownership be received. Thank you, Alan Chong. Second, Alan Hume. Sure. Um, I just wanted to mention that I attended the um, Hobart based briefing session of the um, uh, Taswater's briefing on the on the memorandum of understanding between them and the state government, um, and uh, they out, they outlined in fairly great detail, um, you know, what the changes meant um, for their forward projections. Um, it's a it's a better outcome in in terms of uh, the finances of the corporation, the sustainability of the corporation going forward than would be um, you know, a, a state government takeover. Um, and from that perspective it's a, it's a good outcome um, in that it, it, it also um, you know, meets what the, the state government was aiming for which was to reduce costs for consumers. Um, so I, I, we will at some stage as a council, I understand, um, be having to consider the the uh, resolutions that, that need to be adopted to give effect to that that MOU, um, but I think it's uh, it's a good step forward. Hey, those reports be received. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Uh, are there any other reports? Well, Rip Community Arts. Uh, general meeting, monthly meeting, but I don't have them with me, but I'll forward them on. Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks to the Mayor. Uh, the Tracks and Trails Advisory Committee, uh, the minutes of the uh, 14th of June 2018. And I would like to ask, pose a question to um, uh, Mr Graham in his capacity as Manager of of works within the council. On page three of our report, Mr. Graham, it refers to the Springhaven development, and in particular, a lot has been cleared, and part of Gregson Track will be absorbed into the site. Could you, uh, are you in a position to advise council that once uh, discussions between council and the admin department? of um, Springhaven have been concluded. Will there be a, a, um, a walkway uh, on the uh, southern side of the boundary of Springhaven so that there is a link between um, 
Gordons Hill Road, the Gregson Track and the Gordons Hill Road Reserve. Yes, table the minutes of the meeting. Paul McFarlane, you have a question of that report? Yes, I do. In the context that the Gregson track <coughs> was built within the buffer zone area that belongs to or is owned by Springhaven, the DA that was approved by this council saw the fencing on the inside of the buffer zone. Consequently, the track was built in that area designated a buffer zone for the highway and in the past numerous areas have often had public walkways through them. But it is uh, to my knowledge that the board has now moved the fence from the inside of the buffer to the outside of the buffer which means that in the future any realignment of the track will be in a high risk area as far as my perception is within the banter of the main section of the built up structure that holds the road up. And for me, from looking at it, I haven't had a risk assessment done yet, but I feel that any decision made about this track and <coughs> replacement in the future needs a risk assessment of what kind of uh, track could be built outside of the buffer zone and whether or not we can negotiate to have the track built inside the buffer zone which is a, a less risk environment. Thank you. I'm sure Mr Graham can take the, that perspective on board in preparing his report and conducting the negotiations. Thank you. Any other comments there? Other reports, committee reports? Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to item 11.1. Sorry, Mr. Smith, was that 10.2? Yeah, yeah, it's still oh, going. Sorry, I've got the minutes of the um, Business East Board of Management meeting for July, which uh, copy's been forwarded to the Thanks, Alderman Hume. Are there the final reports? <coughs> moving on then to 11.1, the, that the information in the weekly briefing reports of the 30th of July, 6th and 13th of August be noted. Thanks, Alderman Pierce. Second, Alderman Cusick. Any questions on the weekly briefing reports? Uh, put the motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Uh, there's nothing uh, to report at item 11.2, so I now advise that Council intends to sit as a planning authority under the Land Use Planning and Approvals Act. Moving on to item 11.3.1, it's a development application at 92 Cambridge Road for demolition of dwelling. Thanks Alderman Cusick. Second up, Alderman Pearce, thank you. Would you like to speak to the motion? I want you to say Mr Mayor that this is a derelict house. There was con some concern that the fence, line, the fence be retained and trees be retained and as I understand in the, uh, in the recommendation um, that's covered, the fence will, fence will remain and the trees will remain. Other speakers. Okay, so the motion recommends uh, approval subject to conditions and advice. All those in favour? Okay, unanimously. 11.3.2 is a development application at uh, 10 Kytheria Place, Acton Park, addition to Brian. Thanks, Alderman McFarlane. Second of Alderman Thurley, I'll take. Speakers? Um, this is a fairly standard addition to a previous built dwelling. Um, the, the officers have covered all of the issues that were put forward by the residents and considering the size of the block, the veranda addition is not really a big problem for any kind of storm order or privacy 
um, concerns. Um, just to say that the um, proposed setback distances are considered a practical response to the location of the existing building on the site and there was a little confusion um, but the building is effectively a permanent single dwelling until it is replaced. No need for a right of reply. The motion is uh, approval, subject to conditions and advice. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. 11.3.3 .3 is a subdivision at 8 Blair Street, Richmond, one lot subdivision. Alderman Pearce, thank you. Second Alderman Chong. Alderman Pearce. Thank you. I went and had a look at the site because when I saw it was in Richmond, I was. I was there anyway on Thursday and look, well, once I saw the, the size of the block, it's it's enormous and it's all cutting off this 545 square metres and look, I think it's very appropriate. It's interesting to note that the people around this, there were no objections from the people around it, actually came from the other side of the road. So I thought that was very, uh, very interesting but look, look at this, I think it's perfect for, for another dwelling. Other speakers, Alderman Jones. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to pose a question to Mr. Lovell in his capacity as manager planning. Uh, Mr. Lovell, on page 96, it refers to, amongst other things, that um, uh, under, 11, under E13.8.3, the lot design does not comply as the site is subject to the bushfire prone areas code. As I read through the performance criteria, it does not appear in, in the addressing that particular matter as to whether or not the proposal does, in the section of performance criteria, answer that question. Could you elaborate, please? Yes, in, um, in performance criteria H, it says the application includes certification from an accredited person that was opposed to the exemption from uh, could you, um, supplementary, could you direct me to what page that is because I have. Um, page 97, the performance criteria, the second, uh, second criteria, match. Uh, okay, it might, it seems as though that that's on 97, it's B is it? Not H. Excuse me, my eyes are Yeah, that's right. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. Thanks. <laughs> Other speakers? Uh, right or reply? No. <laughs> <laughs> so the recommendation is for approval subject to conditions and advice. All those in favour? Very 11.3.4 is a section 40A, 43A amendment application at, uh, for six multiple dwellings at 151 Mockery Road. Alderman Farm, um, I understand you are moving one as amended, as circulated? Yes, I want to move the officer's recommendation with the following additional permit condition. Thank you. And seconded Alderman Cusick. Would you like to speak to Alderman Farm? The additional permit condition states that a 3.2 metre wide public right of footway is to be provided over the course of the existing bitumen pathway, which allows council to construct a standard with multi-user pathway through the site in the future if necessary. And B, that the reasons for council's decision in respect of this matter be recorded as following that the existing walkway provides an important link to the underpass, that the applicant is agreeable to the condition and advises that this would allow council to construct a standard with multi-user path through the site in future if necessary. Talking to the um, recommendation put forward, there has been so far no issues as far as the rezoning is concerned. A landscaping plan will be submitted with this and that, um, and I'm pleased to see that there's a landscaping condition which 
shows that the site will be maintained in perpetuity by the existing and future owner occupiers. I would like to think that within the context of future maintenance that um, those issues are, are set to create bushland type settings for the native birds that live in that area where Clarendon Vale and Rokeby are very lucky to have quite big families of different kinds of parrots and galahs. And for those people that put suitable trees in their gardens, those birds become a living, moving landscape of their own. I support the recommendation. Yes. And I support this recommendation. These are social housing units. Um, social families provide accommodation for citizens who might otherwise be sleeping in a car or a tent. Um, I understand this environment pretty well. I was very instrumental in setting up some of these type of entities before I retired. But I would like to speak to the issue of the fees. Um, one of the points made about fee reduction is that um, the, the, the developer could um, it could possibly sell the property or choose not to proceed. I mean, Mr. Tim Goulet, who I know well, has written to point out, written to the council, um, that the above site was selected through a tender process with a director of housing and falls under the regional supply of social housing initiatives. Under the requirements of this program, the property must be developed and held by a community housing provider for social housing purposes for a period, a minimum period of 30 years and, and be tenanted by people of the social housing plan. I don't think there's, there's no doubt that these properties won't be so current and suffer to advance the, the financial gain of the developer. I want to question please, it's been stated that these, as I said, these properties might be sold, etc. Other council fees for similar proposals, I'm told, are between 3000 and 4000 for Glenorchy, Hobart, Kingborough and Brighton. Mr Mayor, I'd like to ask, or post this meeting, could I put out for a summary of what actual costs Clarence Council will, will incur in progressing this proposal? If the cost is around 17000 or more, can I accept the fee as justifiable? Otherwise, in this case, I do not believe we should be charging any more than the cost system. Thank you. Thank you. Other speakers? Orland James. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I um, note in the recommendation that that the uh, Mr Lovell has provided to Council that it refers to a number of conditions. Uh, but then again, um, in reference to the actual position of Council, uh, including in the recommendations, a length of time in which this has to be sort of earmarked for affordable housing. Uh, firstly, <coughs> my question to Mr Lovell is that given that under, on page 113F, that Council adopted as waiving and reducing fees for planning and building permits, resolves to reimburse the applicant 1500 representing the maximum value that can be waived for planning and building permit fees for a not-for-profit organisation. So having said that, my question is twofold. Is there any way in which the recommendation can safeguard that in fact the, the actual uh, buildings can be in the hands or allocated to affordable housing and part B to that question is that the, uh, the reimbursement that's being proposed here, is this just a one-off because are we to assume that if Mission Australia was to put forward an application for um, affordable has uh, housing of this scale, which is possible, then we would uh, regard that as a not-for-profit organisation and similarly uh, would in fact have set a precedent that in fact the uh, mission would follow 
in, <laughs> in concert with, with uh, the uh, uh, Catholic Centre Care in relation to waiving their fees should they apply. Perhaps you could answer those questions for me, please. No? Uh, the second uh, question first was about can, can other organisations apply for a fee reduction or waiver? So the answer would be, to that would be yes, because of the council policy. Any party that demonstrates they comply with the, with the tests in the policy would apply. Um, no, there is no provision of the payment fee on, under LUBA uh, or the land use payment fee uh, uh, um, under the business community payment system in Tasmania to actually control that. That would be a matter that's a private matter to the uh, government and the organisation which would be a good way. It's certainly not something that can be controlled by the payment fee. I will, uh, on page 117 of the report, it refers to uh, the applicant submits that the dwellings are to be built under the State Government Regional Supply of Social Housing Initiative, which is part of the Affordable Housing Strategy Plan. I would contend that, that, um, that the statement here, and it goes on to say that the dwellings will be held by, centre, by a Catholic centre for a minimum of 30 years and used to house eligible tenants. It is actually saying, and it's been included in your report, that there is this um, uh, submission in writing that the, that these uh, dwellings will be uh, available and will be held by Catholic Centre. I, I'm just, I am concerned that we have a statement here from the applicant that there would be this um, proposal, and on that basis, it would seem to me that the question of wavering the fees is a primary reason for us to consider in our rec in the recommend officer's recommendation uh, to uh, council resolves to reimburse the applicant 1500 representing the maximum value that can be waived for planning and building permit fees for not for profit organisation. Look, I, I, I understand this is a, a great project. The council has not included in its recommendation the reason why it has decided to waive the 1500 now, I heard what Mr Lovell said in relation to um, other organisations, but I have never in my time here uh, experienced a, uh, an example of where Council has waived uh, that sort of figure uh, in relation to a not-for-profit, particularly with the affordable housing or where there is some guarantee that the houses will be built. I just want us to be on a, a level playing field here, Mr Mayor, because I think if it's fair for one, it's fair for others, and if this is going to be uh, a case of where we are sort of rebating uh, the actual costs in this instance, then I think it's only fair that there be some sort of um, recognition for other organisations like Mission Australia, which is doing a great job in trying to uh, enter into this area of affordable housing. It just seems to be a, a contradiction in terms and I don't recall, unless I can be corrected on that, as to when we have done this for other not-for-profit organisations and in the case of affordable housing and providing housing for the needy. Okay, well that's something uh, the mover can take on board to write a reply. Any other speakers? Gordon um, King. I just want to say, Mr Mayor, and I, uh, um, in regard to this debate, I, I think that looking at our policy, um, it comes from 2003. Um, it's a fairly short policy. It's a fairly blunt instrument. Um, there's been some, you know, concerns raised around it. Um, I think this is something that would be worth having a having a look at in a workshop um, to see whether you know there's. Um, there's any merit in in looking at the um, the maximum amount that we waived. I mean that you know for one application that's the amount regardless of the scale of the application. Um, you know is it something that maybe could be scaled according to the the size of the application? Um, is it something that 
uh, needs to be increased in circ certain circumstances? Do we need to um, provide a, a better definition of the, the types of organisations that can apply for these things? Um, at the moment, though, the policy is what it is. We, we, can, we can waive up to $1,500. Um, it, it's something that it, it is only a recommendation, so, you know, in response to Alderman James' concerns, it, it, it is something that, you know, should, should someone believe that there, there isn't a case for, for a waiver, um, they could move an alternative motion. Um, but having said that, um, I think this is something that maybe we need to look at down the track. The, the, the fact that we're debating this, I think, indicates that there, there could be, there is a, a rationale for having a good look at this policy. Um, in, in relation to this particular aspect, um, there is no definition of affordable housing under the policy, the scheme or LUPA. And accordingly, um, there are no controls requiring that houses are built and used in this way. Um, and there's no guarantee that it will remain affordable in the longer term. And um, there are events that could occur that the property was to be sold, the owner decides to change how it manages the property, or they chose not to proceed with the proposed uh, multiple dwelling proposal. Now, we've received bona fide um, comments that this will occur, but as I said, there is nothing contained that actually enforces that. Therefore, it is premature to actually waive fees when the outcome is not actually particularly necessarily known. And the reason that um, it may not be suitable to waive $17,000 in this case is because um, the reason to waive it is that it benefits the City of Clarence and the community and this proposal may not necessarily do that as opposed to any other housing development within Clarence or within other areas. Um, I think the, the reason I'm looking at this as a a great development is that um, it, it promotes the objective for sustainable development of land allowing for the efficient use of existing urban zone land and we talked about this on another proposal where we were seeking rezoning as well. Uh, for medium density residential use and development within the urban growth boundary as stipulated by the Southern Tasmanian Land Use Strategy. The thing about affordable housing is that um, there are degrees of what we call affordable housing and um, land blocks can become quite expensive and, and by some may not be considered actually really, really affordable. So there is a little bit of, of play with that word as well. But I welcome this proposal because it actually is going to um, provide uh, wheelchair access in some of the units it's actually going to, as, as the um, proponent has said, um, address the needs and some of the people that are already listed and waiting for housing. So I really, really hope that this proposal addresses those things and that is providing something in the community that we seriously, seriously need. <coughs> Look, uh, a bit's been said around uh, the way forward and I have to concur with the opportunity that a, a workshop might present just to look at this whole matter forward. We're stuck with some blunt straight jackets. Um, there are some cases where $17,500 wouldn't come close to the complexity involved in a rezoning, but in my six plus years at this table, I've never seen a more straightforward, uncomplicated piece of dirt that has, that has come before us. Um, for a rezoning that is that is worthy of um, being put into into the zone that it's proposed to do so. So uh, I'm supporting this, and I'm supporting the the way forward given the, the circumstances and structures that we operate. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Going straight to the topic of waiving fees, I would like to remind all the members that this request that has been put in the conditions is only for $1,500, which is the maximum we can currently approve. 
Um, I would like to say that I, should, I feel Council should consider as a matter of urgency a review of the policy, <coughs> particularly in light of what I hope may be future uh, applications for affordable housing and that we actually have some discussion with the planners as to what we would deem affordable housing to be and how we would promote uh, supporting the community and building those and the redemption of fees where, when requested. I feel that Council doesn't have a policy which supports the community in this aspect and that there is a real need to do this. The other um, small item that this is going out for exhibition, um, I would hope that in the future um, there is a consideration for car parking to be covered on site. I notice in other areas where we've got brand new housing and no covered car parking that for me, in this day and age, car parking is something we need to consider with. Mm -hmm. I support the recommendation. Thank you. So the motion before the Chair is to initiate the draft amendment and to uh, support the six multiple dwelling application, noting the uh, additional clause for a public uh, right of way for the footway. All those in favour? Against? Carried. 11.3.5 is a development application at 13 Cambridge Road, Bell Reeve, um, for alterations, front fence, and uh, change of use to visitor accommodation. Alderman Walker. Seconder. Alderman Cusick, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. So this application is now before us. It's a property that is reasonably well known to the Council. Yeah. Certain iterations of Council believed, uh, I, as I understand and recall, that this is something that maybe should have been in Council's hands, not necessarily with a defined and identified use. Um, <coughs> the use that's coming before us tonight uh, is indeed uh, something that will be beneficial to Clarence. Uh, there is a shortage of accommodation. This is in a very useful location and on that basis that's a supporting uh, factor. But separate to that, the, the application I think will is also supportive of the heritage values of this site and um, the preservation and upkeep of it. Uh, it's noted in here that there is indeed a car park shortage but um, you know there is a standard without prejudice approach to this which is what we're taking and, and there is a cash and loo requirement will be, be sought. Uh, separate to that, there may be a case to argue that um, many of the visitors coming here are, the, uh, are unlikely to be those that will be using motor vehicles, but irrespective of that. Um, the policy is the policy I support it and I certainly support taking it here. So um, I, I seek ultimate support for this, uh, this as per the officer's recommendations. Uh, <coughs> uh, just to say, Mr Mayor, I support the recommendation and agree with uh, all of Alderman Walker's comments. Yes, look, uh, this is a, a chequered history and I, I can recall us debating this some time ago when I think the State Government offered us offered to the Council, and I stand corrected on this figure, but about three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars was off sort of a, an offer that at the time uh, I think we did consider, but at the end of the day it was decided that uh, there was a lot of work to be done if it was to be uh, sort of handed to um, the community and one of the requests at the time was made by John Sargent who in fact wanted to move his uh, maritime collection from its current location, his home in Victoria Esplanade to the site at, uh, at, 17 Cambridge, at 13 Cambridge Road. Look, um, it's something that uh, at the time I was supportive of. I thought that we could utilise this, but at the end of the day, um, it sold for a, a huge price. In fact, I went to the open day that was convened, and uh, and there were a lot of a lot of people interested, and in, I think it may have gone to a mainland company, and uh, and so it was really out of council's reach. At the end of the day, there is a lot of pluses in relation to this. Firstly, that the applicant has 
maintain a lot of the heritage uh, attributes in relation to the property. So the fencing has been addressed and also they're copping up $30,000 for the deficiency in, a public, uh, in public car parking. I, I think it's something that's needed in the area. There is some concern about the number of car parking spaces in relation to where uh, and the extent to which uh, tourists will utilise their car for transport as distinct from the, um, the foot traffic that may and ultimately be generated as a result of its close proximity to Bellroo Village and so on. So look, I think this is a, a great result. I think at the end of the day it's being sort of maintained to a standard that meets, I think, the Heritage Council or does to meet the, Heritage, the Tasmanian Heritage Council. I don't give it a tick in the box subject to a number of plans that need to be considered and I understand that the um, developers have met those conditions and it will be uh, developed in accordance with the tourist industry and also in accordance with the heritage values of the site. I support the application. Um, it's good to see that this um, building has found a home and um, some caring applic applicants who are, are prepared to um, bring it up to a higher standard of presentation. And the only concern I have, of course, is with the parking. And the reason I raise that is because it is adjacent to 17 Cambridge Road, which is the home of the Bell Rift Community Arts. And fortunately, there's been good collaboration between the two, uh, the committee and the uh, proponent, because there was worry, and if you look at the site, it, it, there is direct access from Cambridge Road, but that's only for a, a garage. But the, a lot of the deliveries will be done via crossing over the Bell Reef Community Arts right of way there. And um, there was a, four existing car parks at this site, but it's now been restricted to three because they're building up and creating a wall so that people can actually turn around within the precinct of 13 Cambridge Road. My, there, apparently there's going to be signage to say that the car parking in the Belrose Community Arts area is for community arts only, but I do suspect that there will be a, a bit of overlap at some stage and council will probably at some stage hear complaints that the car parking at Belrose Community Arts is being used by the occupants of the Airbnb next door. So I'm just warning you, but, but everybody's happy to cooperate and create this new development, so I, I just wish it every success. So the motion is uh, before us is for approval subject to conditions and advice. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. 11.3.6 is a development application at 15 Derwent Street, Bell Reeve, uh, Bell Reeve Oval, um, for consolidation of a number of permits. Alderman Jones? I move the recommendation of the officers. Thank you. Second to Alderman Cusick. Thank you. Would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, Mr Mayor. Uh, I do not want to go back in time because one of the reasons for this application, as my understanding, is that there needs to be a consolidation of a lot of these conditions that have occurred over, over, over the years. And also, too, I think that the number of representations and uh, just to give you a sample of the representations, and they have been uh, summarised quite clearly and uh, succinctly in the uh, officer's recommendation on page 218. I've been advised that there were 29 against the extension of the lighting, 12 against extended hours and increased usage, 33 against on current and future noise levels, 28 against on parking and traffic, 8 actually were critical of the BOPT, and 16 critical littering and servicing and also a number of them referring to uh, fireworks, smoke alarms, etc. The officers um, have summarised um, and it's 
all in the detail, Mr Mayor, in relation to the submission that the officers have presented. And it also summarises the, um, the meeting that was convened at the, uh, church, at the church hall in Cambridge Road some months ago when there are a number of concerns expressed by the principal speakers in relation to what has been clearly summarised by the officers in their report and in their recommendation. I do not want to go into the detail here. I believe what the officers have covered is quite clear and congratulatory in relation to what they have spent and in the time and also too in their seeking additional information in relation to this matter. What happens from here rests in the hands of obviously Cricket Tasmania and if they decide to take it to the next step that's their every right to do so. I will sum up by saying that this particular process, okay, and it was clearly stated uh, on page um, uh, 219 of the officer's report that there was a uh, intimation of a development application being presented to council in November 2017. There has been enough information, I believe, at the time for the, um, uh, well, let's say it this way, that there was an indication that the public became aware of this in November 2017. And as a result of that, there were concerns being expressed that by co collating all of these conditions and also addressing what has been perceived by a sort of breakdown in negotiations over the uh, EPN, uh, the Environmental Protection Notice, that's been bogged down in the tribunal for a number of months, uh, well actually longer than that, uh, for a number of years, and in fact the whole question in relation to bringing all these conditions together by extending the hours and not really addressing, in my opinion, the actual noise levels, and that's been summarised in the officer's report. I seek uh, council support to carry this motion unanimously on the basis that the homework that's been done by the officers and in particular the representations that have been made by the, the members of the public, who I might add, Mr Mayor, a number of these uh, Great Pose residents did not contend or submit their application or concerns in the early days of this, but now they have come out in their numbers and in their strengths in, a, in order to be able to say this is an inappropriate development and I think the council officers and I believe this council should carry this motion unanimously. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Um, yeah, I fully support the officer's recommendation. Um, I adopt door knock to all the houses directly adjacent to Blunston in Church and Durham Streets. But the people home, no one supported the proposal. <coughs> Two said it didn't worry them too much, but all the others were against it. I left my card for those not at home <coughs> who later contacted me, no, but no one supported it. The additional noise, longer hours of lighting, uncertainty as to what non-sporting events might be held and how often were concerns. Another comment I received was a lack of interaction with the community from the current Blunston administration. Their now seeming lack of concern and action by that administration uh, as, as, uh, uh, in, in um, contrast to previous administration in relation to rubbish in adjoining streets, apparently under previous Blunston administration they often did a street clean-up following major events, which doesn't seem to happen now, or at least not to the same extent, and more events, more rubbish. <coughs> it was also, as Alderman James alluded to, the public meeting. I believe that, that the, the, uh, it, the administration have made significant investment into this stadium and now want to return on that, that investment by, uh, through changes to their conditions. I've also heard comments that the Oval was there before many of the residents. Sure, but that was back in the, in the earlier days. Saturday afternoon footy games, underage footy on Sunday mornings and summer cricket. It was not a major stadium back then. Thank you. Other speakers? Alderman Pearce. Thank you, Mayor. As most people around this table know, I love my footy and cricket. But I do totally support the officer's recommendation for recusal. We had 37 uh, submissions, they don't say 
I imagine all were against because some things is just a general comment. But let's look at why the TCA, as Alderman James said, they can consolidate certain conditions into one, that'd be great. But we know why the TCA came here, or the cricket test, it's got here, unfortunately game schedules are controlled by broadcast partners. And it's true. They tell you what time your starts. There's no risk on that. And it's got here who have no interest in accommodating local time restrictions. Which again is true. I wish, I wish Cricket Taz had communicated with the people around them, explained to the people around the area why they want to do this, because there's a lot of things I just can't understand. They want to take with all due respect. As I said, I love my cricket football, but they don't want to give anything. They don't want to give anything in return. All they want to do is extend the hours, which I think is totally wrong. I just wish they'd communicate with us. I wish they'd communicate with people because, lo and behold, there are a lot of people that support the over there. I've got people that live close by and they totally support it. But you want to keep those people on side. But if you're not going to consult with those people that already agree with you, you know, how are you going to progress? So I'm a bit disappointed in Cricket Taz that they were at one stage going to hold a public meeting that would all go along to, and I had questions too, but as far as I can see, it's never eventuated, so, which is a real, real pity. Look, I don't know if us refuse this tonight, I don't know if they just want to take it to the appeal uh, situation and work it out there, but I really just wish they'd learn to do a bit more uh, consultation with us, a bit more consultation with the people around it, because if you look at our our map, there's not a, a lot of objections from just around that street. As Alderman Cusick said, he dawned off and a lot of people didn't want those things to go ahead. And for me to be here and saying that I'm supporting a refusal, that's how disappointed I am. Alderman Curley. Um, the idea of consolidating a number of permits is a great idea and uh, we all like to reduce um, documentation and things we've got to adhere to in multiple formats. So it, that's a really good idea. Um, the problem with this is, and, and I think we're empathetic to the fact that um, the broadcasting um, companies will dictate terms. So those extensions are, are really reasonable and uh, if they're finding that they have to break the current permit to adhere to those things, then obviously something needs to change. The problem here has been um, the removal of the distinction between sporting and non-sporting events so that we, we can't tell which is which and that leaves, it, it removes the current cap of six so that, that's a bit of a worry. Um, and there's no real summary of the proposed changes um, in the applicant's documentation and various items of information can be found in different parts of the report. But um, Council undertook a face-to-face -face survey of residents with a, within 100 metres of the boundary of the Oval um, and this survey was undertaken by an external social consultant, Myriad Research, on behalf of Council. And from this information, Council's noise consultant, Peru Turtz, was able to determine suitable controls which then formed the basis for the TFM. Um, the proponent had disputed this process and the results um, and has not adequately determined what environmental harm is in the locality or within the context of what is being proposed. So from that perspective, um, it has left us no alternative um, than to actually support the officer's recommendation. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, um, if you were going to develop a stadium and you were going to start it from scratch, you wouldn't do it where our revival is right now. But unfortunately, that's that's what's happened. It's in a residential area. Um, you, we're, we're stuck with the legacy issues of that. But being in a residential area, um, that puts certain restrictions on what they can do in accordance with the planning scheme. 
um, in, you know, in terms of the things that they're covered in this application, particularly in terms of noise. And, and what, we, what we are to do as a planning authority is to make an assessment of their, their compliance with the scheme. And, and it is as a result of the, the legacy of them being in a residential area um, that this development is clearly non-compliant. But the fact is it's non-compliant. It's non-compliant in five areas, five performance criteria um, the planning staff have identified. Um, I do have a concern, however, and this is not a reason for us to make any other decision than what it appears we're clearly going to make. Um, but I do have a concern that some of those performance criteria, the way they're written, are, are vague enough as to be a bit of a lawyer's picnic. So I, I would be, I wouldn't be surprised if the um, the tribunal mediation, and if it goes even further into arbitration, um, you know, turns out to be fairly long and drawn out and costly. Um, that is unfortunate. But as a planning authority, we need to make our best assessment and best decision. And I think the, the officers have done an excellent job in uh, applying the performance criteria um, as best they can, despite the, um, the vagueness and deficiency in the way that those criteria are written. Um, and I support the officer's recommendation. Um, I too support the officer's recommendation. However, I can see in the future that there may be needs and times for special occasions like lost children, as has been stated in the report, for lights to stay on for the benefit of police and crowd dispersal. It's a very small area with a large amount of people and for those occasions when there are large crowds, I can see some difficulty coming up. I think it's time that that this area was looked at in a much broader picture and that both the community and the Oval sit down and talk to one another. Yes, Mr Mayor, many of the development applications in relation to this site that have come before us whilst I've been an alderman, I've not supported. And two of the aspects which come to mind immediately are the lights, and the parking. And I know that Alderman James and I worked together at various times on one, trying to stop the lights, and two, trying to get increased off-street car parking, but to no avail. And I think it's interesting that it's noted in the report on page 219 that this particular site started out as a community sports centre. And obviously, it was there to meet local needs. It's now become a business site. And in relation to this particular application, the primary focus of this application, yes, is to consolidate other permits, but the primary focus is on meeting TV network demand. So let's be very honest, this is about business decisions. So it's gone from a local community facility to a business, as I say. And I think it's interesting when I read through this and went back and had a look at the other development applications that I've been involved with, the use of the grounds has changed application by application. And it made me think of the quote of death by a thousand cuts. And that's what I feel this is. And so I looked at good old Encyclopedia Wikipedia and what it says there is that death by a thousand cuts is a form of torture and execution originating from Imperial China. I think that's a pretty good description. And in psychology, it's the way a major negative change, which happens slowly in many unnoticed increments, is not perceived as objectionable. Well, I don't agree with Wikipedia on that, because in dealing with this over the years, 
it has actually been very well noticed by the community and it has been objectionable to them. So as far as I'm concerned, what we've got before us is of concern and yes, we can actually sheet it back to the planning scheme in the way that the officers have. I think it's really interesting that when the lights were an issue, people talked to me about their amenity, their health, and now we're looking at noise more so. And I've had a lot of people, apart from the representations that we've actually got, the formal ones, I've had people who know me and who live in that area, they've come to me and they've actually said, we are concerned about the noise, even more so than the lights because noise is much more of an issue in terms of amenity and your health. So as far as I'm concerned, I support the officer's recommendation 100. Thank you. Uh, this particular piece of land in Clarence uh, is one with a <coughs> history going back some time uh, with different <coughs> perspectives and notations around it. Um, we must be mindful of history and whilst being mindful deal with situations that we face in the present. Um, Blunston Arena is unique. There is, there is no other sporting facility like it where you're, you know, you're slap bang on paradise where you can watch a cricket game and literally go for a swim at lunchtime in between. Um, it, is, it is unique and it's magical in many ways but it's also uh, given the proximity of other things, uh, not without its challenges. Um, I don't think Council's always got itself done the right thing when it's faced um, matters before and one of the very first things that came before me was in 2012 uh, when, you know, I suspect if we'd gone with the then proposal of a fence um, that would be opened for the bigger games for egress then we wouldn't have had the uh, industrial size entrance that had to be built when Council refused that. I think that is a that is a matter of great pity for me historically, but we are where we are. Um, looking at what's before us now, I think there's fairly generic agreement that the consolidation of permits is a is a worthy worthy pursuit. Um, they've put some reasons to us why some changes need to be made on a variety of things. Uh, I hope the resolution will be reached. Um, we're dealing with this as a, as a planning matter, but um, you know, the international exposure that we get through the TV things is, is something that you know, we should be proud of and shouldn't be uh, dismissed. I'd hate to see um, the loss of international games as well. Um, I think that they are something that are really appreciated by the parents' community and the wider community. Again, that's not a specific planning matter that we're before us tonight. Uh, <coughs> The outcome of this decision seems, from the other speakers, to be fairly well determined and it's likely that this will be appealed and I'm hoping that if that is the case that that will be the opportunity for some straightforward and open dialogue and negotiations around this. I think we can uh, try and work a way forward um, but I think it's a little bit challenged by the application that Council received. <coughs> By Alderman Jones. So, uh, I'd reply, Alderman Jones. Brief, Mr. Mayor, and just say that the officers, in my opinion, and I think the council um, representatives have, have it right uh, to support the recommendation that's been listed on the agenda. Can I sum up, summarise uh, one of the comments that's been made by uh, Mr. Irene Duckett? on the last page of her submission, on page 99 of 111. And the application seeks to remove reference to sporting or non-sporting to avoid the necessity of categorising different types of events which may not sit clearly within the category, in, within one category or the other. And I'll seek council support. Thank you. So the motion is for refusal for a number of reasons. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Uh, that concludes our business as a planning authority.
Moving on to uh, asset management. Eleven point five point one proposes that council adopts the stormwater asset management plan. Thank you, Alderman Chong. Second, <laughs> Alderman Thurley, I think was. Would you like to speak to Alderman Chong? <laughs> Just briefly, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as you can see from the report, this is a really excellent amount of work that's been done by the officers. Um, what of the things I think is important listed in there is it. Not only does it give us a really good overview of all of our assets, but it also talks about the risk and what we need to look at in the future. So it gives us a great way to strategically look at the stormwater assets going forward. So I think we should adopt this and get to work on it. Second that. I just posed the question. This report was uh, using the new IT software that we have, so it was able to c consolidate. It's only used to be informed the one council model that the council has set up. Um, I think it was, it, it's interesting to actually see the replacement value of those assets in black and white. $153.6 million worth of assets. Um, that's quite a substantial figure and um, in order to um, cover this, this plan and to um, ensure that uh, the operations, maintenance, renewal and upgrade of these assets over a 10-year period occurs, it's been estimated $33,624,000 over that 10-year period. Um, interestingly, the present le funding levels are insufficient to ensure that this occurs, so it's going to need some deliberation on behalf of Council either to make uh, this more efficient um, undertaking or the funding will have to come from another source and hopefully that's not pressure on the ratepayers. So um, it could well include collaboration between another level of government but it's so good to see this in a report which means that planning and budgeting can occur based on some black and white evidence before us. Here I just have a query about um, the executive summary um, which is on page 375 of our agenda. Um, the, so the standard that um, the uh, stormwater assets need to have is the capacity to deal with a, a 1 in 20 ARI which is uh, annual I've forgotten the, what the... <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things I was wondering about is it says here many pipe catchments have insufficient capacity to cope with the current 1 in 20 ARI rainfall event. I was wondering is, is, is the issue there that um, they haven't been kept up to that standard or that that standard's been recently introduced? Or is the standard actually also of 1 in 20 ARI actually changing as, you know, according to climate change and weather, weather events getting more and more extreme? Or is it a combination of all three? Uh, three of it's a combination of a number of things. Um, growth in municipalities um, in sort of the upper reaches of the catchments, but also with the climate change, the figures on the Australian rainfall and runoff have changed significantly as well in terms of increased rainfall intensity. Which we're experiencing. It's also growth in catchments as we expand further up the hill. Um, some of the historic stormwater systems that were installed in the 50s haven't, haven't, weren't installed to take an account of the potential for growth further up the catchment and concentration of things and insufficient pipe sizes. And the work we are doing on the stormwater management plan at present has helped to identify the risks associated across our main urban catchments in relation to that. 
Uh, as, 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 the, as the standard cur is currently measured, um, this plan, if I understand correctly, it's looking at um, getting most of that, or is it 97 per cent, up, up to that standard within a 10-year period? Have, have I read that correctly? Uh, no, no that, that's saying our, our affordability to actually afford what we're planning to spend over the next 10 years, we can afford at our present current budget level, is 97 per cent. So we can't actually an improvement plan to get to that 100 per cent, it's what we can actually afford. But on another side, <coughs> these figures are based on our current knowledge of the systems as well, based on the 75 year um, design life. One part of the next four year review um, is to actually review, get actual evidence of design life. For example, Hobart and Glenorchy have increased their design life to 100 years, which means the replacement time extends significantly and uh, what we need to or save for future replacement actually comes down. So as a level, for us to be at 97% is actually good. If we were spending 105%, it means we're actually spending ratepayers' money on additional expenditure, which we actually don't need at the moment. So, uh, as we as we work on getting um, the infrastructure up to the standard, um, coping with a one in twenty ARI rainfall event, um, at some point where I'm guessing that we're going to have a um, a stage where we're not going to have to spend as much because we're not not playing catch up, or is is that correct to say, no, or not? Two different things. Okay. This is actually looking at replacement. So we're trying to ensure the council is saving and spending sufficient money now so that in 50, 70 years time when that um, pipe is due to be replaced, we are in a financial position to actually replace that pipe. It's looking at a financial position, it's not looking at actually, uh, it's a risk we have, some pipes are under capacity, which is a different risk to the sort of financial risk of us being over in a financial system. Pipe instead, previously pipe instead for that. These plans are looking at growth in the system, capacity to, to growth in the system, but also capacity to replace those ageing assets as they fall over. So it's a combination of all of those aspects. Um, and uh, sorry, what I would say is if, if when Council adopts the, this plan and the, and the, and the, and the um, growth management plan, which is the next one on the agenda, um, the numbers that have been churned out of these reports will be turned into our 10 year financial plan for, for, um, as part of the review of the financial for the 10 year financial plan. I guess, Alderman Pierce. Yeah, I, I must say, Mayor, I was staggered when I read this report because it's something you never sort of look at it in a sense when you realise we've got pipes and coal that's 396 kilometres and their replacement value over a million dollars. I found this report, I found it excellent actually, I've read it a couple of times now. Oh really, did I? Yeah, I know, I need, I need to get it on. But, but when, you, when you read it, it was absolutely amazing because it really makes you think that, you know, what we've got to look out for in future and cost-wise. But I really congratulate the people on this report, I think it's really great. I reply, um, just to say, I think the comments and the, and the risks that have been mentioned by the Alderman exactly say why we need this report and why we need to deal with it on an ongoing basis. And I seek Council's support. So the recommendation is that Council adopts the Stormwater Asset Management Plan 2018. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Item 11.5.2, Roads and Transport Asset Management Plan. Thank you, Alderman Curley. Second, Alderman Cusick. Alderman Curley, would you like to speak to this? <laughs> Again, I will um, point out that $456.7 million worth of assets. Alderman Pierce? Yes, <laughs> uh, through the chair. <laughs> sorry, <please>. sorry. <laughs> um, and adopting this um, plan will assist Council in meeting the requirements of the National Sustainability Framework and um, provide services needed by the community in a financially sustainable way and the plan if adopted and implemented it means that council is well placed over the next 10 years 
to maintain current levels of services, <coughs> which is fantastic, and Council is able to fund the current infrastructure life cycle at the current levels of service and available. Um, this, this plan includes, which I think is great, reviewing the management of capital projects and that is to ensure that Council is always obtaining the best value for the resources used and that Council must ensure going forward that capital upgrades and new projects deliver the defined level of service in the most efficient way. Um, yeah. um, this, this is similar to the stormwater management uh, plan. Um, I mean, whatever level of value of assets, it doesn't really matter. Sound management is what's essential. And, and um, as I say, here, Local like Government Act 1993, Section B requires Council to prepare, to prepare long term strategic management plans for the municipal area to cover a 10 year period. I think it's good. Other speakers? Um, Mayor, I'd just like to comment on both this particular plan and the previous one. I actually think it has. Uh, Alderman Pierce has said that it's been really well written and uh, very informative. But I actually also like the way that it's been written in a quasi-academic manner and that it actually has a, a reference list uh, at the end. And it's really pleasing to see that the Institute of Public Works Engineering Australia, is it Australia or Australasia? Australasia has actually um, had some involvement in, in, as far as the document control is concerned. So, yeah, well, it really well done. Thank you. Um, I too support the fact that this has been written in plain English for a lot of people. Within the executive summary on page four, it talks about managing the risk and quotes that we will endeavour to manage the risks within the available funding by identifying breach inspections, rectifying footpath audits but, and implementation of recommendations from road safety audits. Now these, I would believe, refer to engineering outcomes but for me it uh, refers to including somewhere in there community road safety messaging. So I hope that within the context of what we do, um, within our asset management plan, that those sorts of messaging are actually included in the asset management. Our speakers. Okay, so I reply, Alderman Thurley. Uh, this is a really, really important plan. I've always uh, stipulated that infrastructure is one of the foremost um, considerations of council and that um, these assets serve the Clarence City Council, their roads, their community roads, there's transport needs involved, um, there's curb and guttering, footpaths, all those things that council are really responsible for. Um, and as I said, this will enable um, council to develop options and costs and priorities for future road and transport services um, and importantly consult with the community to plan future services to match those the needs of the community and <coughs> with the ability to pay for services and maximise community benefits against these costs. So it, it really is a good chance to um, maximise um, the, um, the good levels of service that we have with our infrastructure. Thank you. The motion is that we adopt the Roads and Transport Asset Management Plan for 2018. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. And on behalf of Council General Manager, could I uh, ask you to commend the staff involved in the preparation of both of these reports? And things but that completes asset management. Moving on to governance. Seven point seven point one is the Rawson Hill Development Public Meeting. A further report. No, I'd like to move a motion that Council receives and considers a report. Do we have a copy of that? It's here, Mr. Mayor. Oh, 
Oh, me, yeah. Yeah. We need a, an actual we written really copy, of all of it. Copy this this happened last meeting. No. And now are, happened are we again. able to have this uh, no. copied and, and passed around to the members? Um, I, I think we ought to be uh, moving the officer's recommendation at this point. If that fails, then we'll move down the other path uh, as a matter of uh, procedure. So the officer's recommendation, is anyone prepared to move the officer's recommendations? Paul McFarland, second it. Yeah, I'll second it, uh, Mr Mayor, in the interest of being able to speak to it. Paul McFarland. There's been a lot of discussion about this recommendation. I would like to note that the draft community consultation policy which has been reviewed by an external audit um, process is about to come to, to Council for consideration and where the recommendations are adopted by the Alderman. I'm hoping that that will be before this Council sits down. The implementation of online engagement and consultation tools is a good recommendation. However, I think that we need to support those with adequate community education and adequate online support so that people can actually contact somebody when they're using consultation tools. And I'm thinking of um, programs that might include voting. Also, that when we have and we get back the pending report from the audit panel, that we then put similar that document out for consultation as well. Yeah. Can I ask for a number of clarifications on the responses? Certainly. Thank you. Mm. Uh, I think firstly, probably Mr. N uh, Mr. Nelson, uh, the motion one called for for the council to revoke the preferred development agreement under developments. Um, and the report says the agreement has no further role to play in respect to that development and it is therefore concluded. Could you just clarify why why it's concluded? Sorry, through you again. Um, the uh, preferred developer agreement is effectively concluded at, at the time that the development application was lost. So there was nothing more that they could do. A statutory process took over from the, the lodgement time. Um, so when, when we say that there's nothing more to do, it literally has no more role to play. So um, motion to which council initiate the further expression of interest process. Council can't do that while the development application is still on the table? Correct. Right. Okay. Um, just one further clarification. The establishment of a community consultation unit. In response, this council undertakes significant community consultation, both statutory and non-statutory, and hence has a process in place. Within the council structure, project officers and their managers coordinate this process. The wide-ranging nature of consultation activities would make a specific unit to establish... Would, no, no, is that saying that the wide-ranging nature of consultation activities would make a specific single unit unworkable because uh, council needs to be drawn from a wider range of people depending on project and location. Hold on, General Manager, just, just to clarify what's meant by that statement is, is we have um, a whole range of various aspects of the organisation through community development, through asset management, through finance, um, through marketing and events, all undertake um, um, uh, community consultation activities at all times. What is meant by that statement is that there is a key currently a coordination mechanism to ensure that that messaging is appropriate in accordance with council policy and consistent, etc, etc, uh, on, I'd say on most occasions. Um, and we don't believe at this point in time, particularly given that we're in the midst of already a review of our overall consultation policy, that it may be that it's really um, um, timely to go down that path at this point in time. There are other other um, uh, things in train at the moment. That may be something we consider further down the track, but at the moment, um, given the nature of our consultation and, and the ongoing review of the consultation policy, it's not considered necessary at this point in time. 
Have we seek any community input for the review or not? Um, through you, we would expect to come back to Council with a community concept draft, community okay. consultation policy. At that point, what Council decides to do with that is a matter for the Council at some point in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Portland Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, there's a number of factors here that um, uh, concern me in as much as that the motions that were carried at the public meeting uh, and they have been covered um, by the officers but it seems as though that um, the Clarence City Council not necessarily revoke its preferred development agreement with Hunter but because a stalemate has existed between Council and the State Government and a letter that we've actually written to the Premier as to, to describe what the situation is in relation to Rosney Hill then by the very nature, and I'm not trying to um, pressure the, the general manager to do this, this is just an observation that I'm making uh, in relation to part motion number one and also which refers to I believe to number two and three and four of the motions that were carried. And that is that the, the general manager may exercise his right not to consent and that may be the end of it, even though we are awaiting some confirmation as to whether or not the, um, the um, manager of Parks and Wildlife is of the view that, that he doesn't need, or as the delegate, doesn't need to provide his consent. So by the very nature of the general manager not deciding or will not provide his consent, then that would mean, I believe, that the development application would not proceed because it takes two to tango and in this instance the manager of Parks and Wildlife has come back to council in, in a written format and said that we, he doesn't need to provide his consent, the general manager can provide his consent or otherwise. And if the general manager does not provide his consent then the development application, I believe, would not proceed because as the administrating uh, agent of council, which the GM is in this instance, therefore the development application would not proceed. Having said that, then council could initiate a new process over again and call for expressions of interest, which would be in keeping with part two of the uh, motion that's been um, uh, passed and carried at the public meeting. Thirdly, and this is probably a, an important part of it, is that the officers have said that it's inappropriate for a community consultation unit um, because uh, within council is adequately resourced and supported as to return, etc. That's the motion. What has happened or what has occurred on page 500 is that the officer report has said there are two processes of community consultation. One a statutory consultation and the other a non-statutory consultation process. In my opinion 2.12 is not really specific and it would constitute in my view a community consultation unit being established which by the very nature would be a much more fluid nature or manner to deal with these sorts of things rather than what um, a non-statutory consultation occurs in in a much more fluid manner as a quote from the, uh, from the um, officer report. So I believe that what those motions were passed at the public meeting can be addressed and by the very nature of the general manager refusing to give his consent because of the very nature of um, what the uh, manager of Parks and Wildlife has said. Therefore, we have, we can act upon those um, three and obviously um, uh, part four uh, of those motions that were carried and that council as next many advisor general manager to not give the landowner consent. Well, we, we won't tell them uh, the general manager not to give his consent because we don't have that, that um, 
directive capacity, but by the very nature of the general manager not providing his consent, that is the end of it in my opinion and therefore the development will not proceed and we can start the process over again and that by the very nature would mean that it would be open and transparent and the whole process would be uh, appropriate. The motion that I, I still think I've got half a minute left, that Council receives and consider a report at next meeting. For, I haven't got enough time. Oh, thank thank you. you. Could I take that as you willing to foreshadow another motion yes. if this fails? Yes. Thank you all. Yeah. Uh, other speakers? Yep. Alderman Walker? Uh, look, in general, uh, I've gone through this and I think in the tight, tight timeline the officers have had, they've done a, a pretty good job. Uh, the biblical saying that he who is a, without sin cast the first stone, however, comes to mind. And around this chamber in council meetings, I have chucked a couple of stones in the form of bringing notion, notices of notion or amended things, uh, at moving them at, as the council is sitting without prior distribution. And I'm a little concerned um, that that didn't, didn't happen in this instant. Uh, I think it's probably unlikely uh, that I would have supported uh, my uh, Alderman James's motion but I don't know what it is or was. Uh, it's now before me and I'm going to read, out, read it out to find out uh, what probably in my opinion should have been read out in the beginning as I said consistently over time I have brought forward things literally uh, in the instant uh, as we consider an item. Now, Alderman James was proposing that Council receives and considers a report at its next meeting from the General Manager on the complete status with the Rosney Hill Reserve development proposal and recommendations for all actions it may take, including maintaining Council's administration with the proposal or withdrawing from the proposal in consultation with the developer and the State Government. Uh, I believe we probably should have dealt with that first. But anyway, I'll put that to the side and we'll deal with what's at hand and, and vote on that accordingly. <coughs> Thank you, Alderman Walker. Alderman Phil? Um, listening to Alderman James, it all sounded so simple as to how to put an end to, to all of this. Um, really very simple at this stage. But there are a lot of considerations before you actually can just cut something off at this stage of the process. Um, council in conducting public consultation or community consultation um, has to really be sure and certain in what it presents as a proposal to a um, public meeting. And uh, quite often with um, the statutory consultation elements we have to have a DA in front of us to actually be sure, sure that what we're talking about because Community consultation can happen and then something changes and then council is at fault because it's not accurate and there's been things going on behind the scenes which we deal with uh, because things alter. You have to be certain that what you're presenting to the public is actually a real thing. Uh, we are not, as a council, to direct the general manager in any shape or form in relation to landowner consent. And what we've got at the moment is waiting on clarification to ensure that legislatively it is all correct. And that can easily, as Alderman James has said, be set aside and uh, go ahead and let's make a decision. There's, there's a developer in this instance who actually has proceeded down the track and it doesn't matter whether it's a situation where any of us are not happy about it, but there's also a due respect afforded to people that are wanting to develop in our community. And sometimes when we have public consultations, the public's not happy because they don't get a, they don't get a result they want. And then the council's accused of not consulting properly because the outcome is not what the community or the people at that meeting actually expected. Um, we see that all the time. We see it in Hobart. We see it elsewhere. Um, we have to be confident that our community consult consultation processes are sound and we have already got in place a review of those. 
And that, that occurred before we have the instance we're discussing now with Rosemary Hill. So we're waiting on that to actually confirm. But based on what we currently do, there doesn't seem to be a need for a massive change in our practices. But um, we need to be mindful of the fact that we can't... This, this, look, I feel a certain degree of, of discomfort, but this process has come to this point um, and it has to be dealt with in a very appropriate manner. And it's not for council now to, to run cold and go, oh my goodness, it's all too hard and we're going to withdraw. Because that maybe is what we're seeing from the state government. Somebody has to make a decision when this DA will come before us, that is the time to argue the pros and cons of this development and it will be evident um, at that time whether this proposal actually stacks up. At the moment we've come down this path and we're waiting on legal advice and we're waiting on the state government to really reinforce their position in this matter because this is, this is state government owned land which we have management rights over and um, everybody's seeming to wipe their hands a little bit at the moment and we just have to stand strong. Thanks, Alderman Thurley. Other speakers? Alderman Pearce? Yeah, I do want to say something. We seem to be giving the recommendation is the council notes a review of the re revised draft community consultation policy is to be submitted to, submitted to council shortly. And we're not really talking about the Rosny Hill development as such. And it notes the decision to implement online engagement and consultation tools. So that's what we're actually talking about, the, co the consultation engagement practices and so on. So that's really what we're talking about at the moment, which I totally agree with. Some of the motions passed at that meeting are a bit ambiguous, which I understand being at a public meeting, we don't expect it to be perfect. And there's one there that even I said to the general manager, how do you interpret it? How do you interpret that? motion because it's so open. I think uh, we do need to get this report back and just see what's going on. Uh, I will say one thing of similar lines to Alderman Walker said about Alderman James's motion. I mean, I've seen them brought up here myself, but at least uh, it would have been nice to at least have heard what the motion was, uh, you know, just to see uh, what would happen with it. Uh, just on that, look, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, the motion was revealed and I think it's useful during a debate and before we vote on this particular motion, but I do think that as a matter of courtesy we should have the option of seeing what's put up uh, and uh, if it comes up as a foreshadowed motion, I, I suspect we'll have to suspend the meeting for a while, long enough to get the, the motion circulated so we all can consider it. So procedurally it's not dead, it's just... Uh, uh, getting it into some sort of sensible order. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Alderman Chong, did you want to? Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just briefly, um, I guess as noticed from the last council meeting, we did um, say that we would write to the Premier and Minister for Parks asking for clarification. Um, that was done and we received an acknowledgement he'd got the letter. That's all. A work in <laughs> so, progress. So hopefully a work in progress. Um, I guess with my with my audit panel hat on too, um, perhaps to flesh that out a little bit of what's going on in that engagement practices. Um, we recognised a year ago in the audit panel that there are some concerns about community engagement on a much broader level, and that's not just in relation to a particular development application or a particular community or a particular strategic plan that we put out but also in the way that we do consultation. Obviously, social media has changed things, websites have changed things, and one of the things that we need to do is look at how we do that consultation holistically. So not just the sort of traditional put things in the foyer and expect, expect people to come and read them, but how do you do all of these things 
through Facebook or websites. And, and a lot of the work that's being done through these engagement practices and the, the uh, consultation policy is dealing with a lot of those things and how we deal with this new ways of interacting with people as well. So I do think it's important that we wait and get that information and have a really good look at it before we decide whether a consultation unit is appropriate or not. It may well be. But until we get this information and we have a chance to have a really good look at it, I think it's premature to decide that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I think it's important to note, as it says in the report, that there's actually been some work going on since 2016, apart from the Audit Committee review. And this work actually came out of one of our staff members being involved in the public sector management program. And so a, if you like, project which was auspiced by the general manager has been going on for quite a long period of time and a document of this size has actually been developed which is a draft and is titled Clarence Community Planning and Development Framework. So it's a draft. It hasn't gone out to public consultation. There has been work being done for a couple of years now. And it is at a high level and a strategic policy. So I think that's really important to note because it's detailed in here and it's, it's also going to link in with practice, so obviously policy and practice. So I totally agree with our Acting Deputy Mayor that we actually have to wait to see what comes out of both of those and then to look at how we resource appropriately. And obviously, they will be being looked at from a public consultation perspective in relation to, if you like, the aspect of planning and development across the whole of council involving the community and looking at engagement and then as a component of that consultation. So, really important for us not to be making decisions on the spur of the moment and for our community to realise that we have been working on this aspect of council. So they are the two important things for me. As far as, and that obviously relates to motion number three, as far as the other three motions are concerned, I believe that the officers in the report have actually covered those very clearly and as perhaps um, those here, the aldermen and perhaps various members of the gallery know, I actually put up a motion on notice which I actually revoked uh, because I believe that what is being done at an officer level in relation to dealing with the various issues is actually the right way to go. We are getting more legal advice, that council getting legal advice, and obviously the state government, when they get back to us, they've already got back to us via officer to officer. Last council meeting, we actually approved that it was mayor, actually acting mayor, to the Premier and I would imagine that we're going to get the same advice back from the Premier, say government wise, that we got officer to officer. But we have to realise that it is the state government's legal advice as compared to council's legal advice. And so then it will need to be, in relation to the consent matter, the general manager, because that is what the legislation says, he will need to make that decision. So at the moment we are in a position where we do not have all the information for the general manager to be able to make that decision. <coughs> so I actually believe that 
all four of the motions which came before the public meeting are being Yeah, on the issue of um, public consultation, um, we do have the advice of the officers in this report. But having said that, um, you know it, it is up to council ultimately. If if we did decide to pursue the idea of a community consultation unit, then then that's something um, we could do. I think it's something that's worthy of having a further look at um, in the context of the review of our community consultation policy. Um, but I, I don't think I'm going to make myself very popular for saying this, but I, I think that um, one of the issues that's coming up in terms of this matter, um, and, and also more generally, is, and I think it's one of the things that, that, that has caused some anxiety in the community, is when there is a, um, when we uh, don't consult on matters um, there's an expectation that we do, but the, the reason we're not consulting is because we're not actually in control of the outcome. Now, when we had that first um, public meeting on the Rosney Hill development, that meeting was convened by the developer, and I know the mayor at that meeting was at pains to point out that it was the developer's proposal. And when the developer had that preferred development status, it was within it was within the gift of the developer to put forward um, the application that they decided to put forward, uh, and ultimately it would need to comply with council's planning scheme to receive planning approval. But at that stage, um, when they had preferred development status, it was their development. Now, one of the things that I I worry about is if we start to embark in com uh, council starts to embark on community consultation processes about matters which we cannot influence. Right between between the granting of preferred development status and the lodgement of the development application, it was it, it has been up to the developer, and this is this is the case with uh, any process where preferred development status is granted um, for, for any site that is earmarked for development. And I must say there has been extensive consultations on the plans that preceded those expressions of interest processes. Um, but the expectation was that council would run a consultation process about a matter which it was actually um, for the developer to put forward. Um, so I, I think Perhaps the other thing we need to look at in terms of consultation is managing those expectations um, and, and also the expectations around planning processes. Um, in terms of um, the Kangaroo Bay development, the first planning application, we were criticised about the timeline for that, but we were required by law to follow the statutory process and the statutory process set that timeline. Um, I think I think that we need to, in addition to yes, we can improve our community consultation processes. Yes, we can adopt more online tools. Um, you know, I don't think our our community consultation processes are perfect. Um, but let's all look. Let's also look at the question of managing expectations about uh, through consultation, what we can actually influence. Thank you. I reply. All in fine. Well, Mr Mayor, I will just read out the conclusion from the staff report to clarify those three motions as in the report. And it states that Council has sought further advice regarding the motion in respect of the proposed Rosen Hill development. With the exception of motion three passed at the public meeting, there are either no or very limited opportunities for Council to take action. In respect of Motion 3, Council has well established community consultation mechanisms in place and continues to develop those mechanisms. From this perspective, establishment of a community consultation unit is not recommended on the basis that such a unit would not contribute to a substantial change to consultation methods or outcomes. 
from what I hear from the conversations put forward so eloquently by all of the aldermen, there is a confusion between consultation for planning and consultation as per a consultative regime by council on its responsibilities. The difficulty for council, as Alderman Cole just stated, has been in the context of the consultation periods for various applications where the community find it difficult to get information uh, adequately and timely and also to be able to participate. Some of those applications like Kangaroo Bay can be can need some intensive research and the time frames are not adequate for those sorts of research details sometimes to be put together and collated. So the difficulty for me in looking at the outcomes of these motions is that I believe that we can influence the council's community consultation processes and that within the audit that we've done we will gain some uh, better ways of doing our own consultation. And with regards to the community consultation unit, I think that we should look at what could be seen as a community committee that interacts on the broader issues within livability, etc. So that where in the past councils had an ability to create strategic plans under the planning schemes through local area plans, that that's where community, established community groups could interact. Because that seems to be that area that's been missing and I feel that it's the current statewide planning scheme that's the problem. Thank you. So the motion before the Chair is that Council notes three things. Uh, Community draft community consultation policy uh, shortly for consideration, the decision to implement online engagement consultation tools and there's a pending report from the audit panel. All those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. 11.7.2 Clarence Coastal Policy Funding and I note that there's a uh, uh, circulated a, a minor variation to uh, to what's recommended concerning community uh, consultation with the Lord Bell community. Alderman James. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Are uh, you moving it? I am in moving it. Do you have a second? Alderman Chong. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, the motion is, uh, and I won't read it in its entirety, but that the annual estimates, top of the estimates, be amended so that 35,000 can be transferred from the Bamber Reef Trial Groin design project and applied to the proposed development of the Clarence, draft Clarence Coastal Policy within the environmental program. And most importantly in this motion, Mr Mayor, the Council write to the Lauderdale Community Advising Office change. Um, it, it would seem that this is uh, the discussion on the on the groin um, that was a matter of discussion with the community uh, some years ago, and I can't recall, but it was well back, I think, in 2011, 12, 14, was it? Uh, two, thanks, Mr. Graham. Uh, 2014, where there was um, uh, general support for a groin off Bamber Reef. Since then, the cost of this project has sort of uh, gone out of <laughs> all proportions and uh, therefore uh, the actual uh, advice from the consulting engineers is that it would be very costly to construct the reef, uh, the groin and also to there may have to be a domino effect down the track but once you put in one groin then there is that expectation that you would have to um, uh, build other uh, groins as part of the uh, discerning of the wave action and the and the <laughs> movement of the current in relation to that particular area. Notwithstanding that Bamber Reef was decided and uh, 
I remember a colleague of ours who was in this place some years ago <laughs> suggested, and it was Tony Muller at the time, suggested that there ought to be some large tyres uh, and filled with cement or some uh, highly uh, um, immovable substance so that there would be some uh, reef, uh, uh, bamboo reef for, or a, grown, a groin design that would be less, expen less expensive and more in keeping with the sort of environment there. But nevertheless, um, the, the, the decision that has been provided to us and it's been a number of workshops up to the time that, that we have had this discussion about the groin, uh, I think it's appropriate now that we decide that this is the right uh, means by which to go ahead and that we advise a lot of our communi community accordingly. I seek council support. Thank you. Under our current strategic plan, we have uh, strategies that are about um, developing a climate change strategy adaptation and mitigation action plan and ensuring the community is well informed. I think we've waited a very long time for an updated state coastal policy and probably we can keep waiting for a very much longer time. Working on this and making sure that we have an appropriate coastal policy to deal with this and communicate that with and develop it with that. from the Bamber Reef Trial Coin Project to the Coastal Policy Project. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Item 12, Alderman's Question Time. There's nothing on notice. Questions without notice. I think Alderman Von Berta, can we start with you? Alderman Piers? No. Alderman Doust, Alderman Kissing? Yeah. Uh, just a couple of questions um, to the General Manager. Do you do a highway speed limit change? I noticed there's some, some electronic signs up there now, both ends, asking for, for public comment on on the on the, uh, on the proposed change. Has council received anything back from DSG or whoever on on I'm that? I'm through with Ben. I'm um, no, getting head shakes behind you there. No, not received. We haven't received anything back. And the second one, and I've already mentioned this to the general manager. There's a burnt out car, I think it's Pilchers Hill it's called, which is down below the Flagstaff Gully Reservoir. It was burnt there about two months ago, three months ago. And it, the hill was sort of like that. And this car, apparently, you can see it from, say, Euroban Street, was leaning against the tree. The tree seems to have disappeared. And apparently, I've been told, there's people up there, presumably kids, trying to push it further down this hill. Now, if somebody gets in front of it, and the car rolls over the top of them, I wonder if we could look at removing that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. There are only one question from me tonight. Um, in the Mercury on the 11th of August, um, there was an article talking about uh, Metro Tasmania um, holding a consultation over a um, river Derwent ferry proposal. Um, and it's, it's unclear. I, I think they're talking about the state government's proposal, which is um, yeah, Bob, Bob Clifford was talking about needing at least six caddies, whereas the infrastructure minister is talking about just having a, a ferry service between Bell Reeves and the city. Um, if Bell Reeves is involved, obviously council is a significant stakeholder. The meeting's happening tomorrow. Are we invited to that and are we being consulted? The answer is yes, I have been. And yes, I'm going. <laughs> And as far as I know, uh, um, if anyone else wanted to go, I can't see why they wouldn't be able to. I, in fact, I think the invitation there was actually right. on that, yeah. just having a shot. There was a notice in the paper that there was open right. to the public, public meeting, and they had to apply yeah. by a certain date. That's right. Yeah. It was in the paper. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, uh, Order Two questions. Um, I mentioned earlier on in the evening about uh, the need for a risk report on Gregson's track. If I can just highlight that need again. Uh, um, is that a question? Yes. Uh, you might recall we've uh, asked Mr Graham to take that into account. 
I'm just making sure. Thank you. Did you have a second question? I don't. Um, that, the question is through you to the general manager. Could the council have, as a matter of urgency, a review of the policy on the reimbursement of, for not-for-profit organisations with adequate documentation on affordable housing? Because I think that we need to address this Look, yeah, I've got the question, weeks. and I think it's probably a good question. Um, through Mr Mayor, um, we will certainly undertake that information and we will listen for a workshop. I am mindful of the fact that we have a very, very... Very, very little, yep, that's right. ...prior to the Corbyn election. Um, and um, there will be no other workshops after the election's been called on the right. 8th of September. Um, so we're going into a period of reduced activity, I guess, in campaign modes for those that are recontesting. Alderman Thurley. Um, I had the, priv uh, the privilege of attending a homelessness roundtable for the rural women of Australia as a representative for um, Algwa. And I must admit, I sat there feeling quite... Um, yeah, we need a question. I'm getting there. Don't worry, don't worry. Question. I'm actually putting some context around it. Or if the context could be actually, rather brief, please. <laughs> what contribution does the council make to evaluate levels of homelessness in Clarence and what measures would it... Um, take to alleviate homelessness within the city of Clarence? In, in other words, what can council do about homelessness in council, in Clarence? Mr Tui? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, um, we, we do participate in the survey that's undertaken um, possibly every, every two years to try and identify the extent of homelessness within Clarence. And, um, Want to follow up, Lauren uh, Fairley? the fact that this issue is quite a societal community issue, I don't. I as, know, it's a question. as an alderman, I would like to know whether we have levels of homelessness and what levels of homelessness we have in Clarence. And if I can't get the answer from council, then who is your connection in state government to provide that information? Uh, through you, Mayor, I'm unable to provide any further informational evidence in respect to that. Uh, what I can do is undertake to contact state government and other Yeah, that would be helpful. Thanks. On Walker. Uh, Mr Mayor, a question to the General Manager through your good self. Uh, as you uh, alluded to, uh, a council election is uh, but impending um, and uh, as tends to happen with these processes, uh, various chatter around imposing compulsory voting onto the local government in Tasmania uh, is a subject that gets uh, percolated. Uh, feeling a question coming on. Uh, is, uh, is <laughs> and the question is, uh, to the general manager, should this occur in Clarence, given the previous uh, participation rates, just what level of impost do you believe this would be uh, on the budget for the council to reimburse the TEC as we have to chase down people and demand an excuse as to why they were so impertinent as um, not to put out the point? I'll, I'll give you a somewhat vague answer, and that is um, on the basic voting numbers we have at the moment, <coughs> an expectation of compulsory voting. Um, it probably wouldn't double because we send out the required number of ballot papers, but it would certainly add significantly to the, the extent of the, the uh, account. It would add certainly then 
uh, extensively in relation to matters of follow-up for non-voting and the like. In terms of the quantum of dollars, that's an estimate that I'd have to take on notice and that specifically that's an And respecting that, um, would you, however, be surprised if it was amount less than 150000 <laughs> um, I probably wouldn't like to speculate about a, a particular amount given that off the top of my head I can't remember what the actual election costs and I'm um, not probably in a position to ask um, Sir Bart to uh, outline that figure either, but it would certainly have, um, I, I'll answer it this way, I wouldn't be surprised if it added at least another 50% to what we're already paying for, for the election, for the conduct of an election. Questions. Firstly, um, uh, my question is in relation to uh, rock fill and other uh, um, filling that's occurred at the uh, Kangaroo Bay Hotel and uh, Training Centre. Um, and my question through you to Mr. Paul. Uh, Mr. Paul, um, is there any limitation on the amount of rock tonnage? that's going into the site or any filling because it seems as though more land is being claimed than what has been envisaged within the, um, the permits that have been approved by Council. I'm not aware that any of the permits actually stipulate a particular tonnage of rock material but though the planning permit does stipulate an area that, uh, to which the land, to which the fill, if I can call it, that is to be, to be, to be confined. I would, um, on the basis of sort of, I suppose it's underlying the question, ask council officers to actually check over the coming days as to whether the area is being filled strictly in accordance with the permit. Uh, recorded in a, a weekly briefing report. Um, we'll certainly report okay. findings to council. Thank you. My second question is, and I did provide uh, advice to Mr. Tui in his, in his, in his position as uh, the appropriate officer uh, regarding 39 Cambridge Road. Uh, to uh, a question, uh, Mr. Tui, is there any limit on the number of times an extension can be applied for each subsequent application in, with respect to the 39 Cambridge Road and also in respect to 39 Cambridge Road, the building permit, I understand, expires at the end of August 2018. And is it possible for that permit to be extended and extended and extended and extended? So if, uh, through you, Mr Mayor, if uh, Mr Tui could uh, accommodate my questions. Is that, uh, is that a third question? <laughs> uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Uh, the building permit can be extended, provided they have the support of the type of building surveyor the developer is engaging, and and we and the permit authority is required. Look, um, I, I did in my uh, elaborating on my question to Mr. Tui, I did say to him, I'd ask him as to whether uh, it's possible for the permit to be extended and also should, yeah, and, and, when, yes. and when there is some finality in relation to this because it can go on indefinitely. Uh, can it go on indefinitely? No. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, that uh, brings us to the conclusion of the open session. Can I thank the members of the public who have uh, lasted the distance and uh, appreciate it. Uh, we, we clearly do have to go in a closed session. We don't have the privilege of a cabinet like the state and federal colleagues, so uh, we need to do it that way. Thank you. Have a uh, move. Uh, thanks, all and peers. Second order on Hume. All those in favour? Very unanimously, thanks.